today I will be talking about right here on platform. Uh, however, let me start with a broader motivation for what I do. Um, we are this day surrounded by all kinds of two-sided matching platforms that are still ultimately trying to do the task to match the buyers with sellers. However, what happened over the years is that we've delegated a lot of decisions to the platforms. So the platforms are usually the ones that are choosing the matching rules and the pricing. However, there's still a lot of private information uh, that is involved in all of these markets. Uh, for example, the, willing, the exact realization for the willingness to pay or the willingness to sell over seller and buyer that meet. And that private information affects um, how efficiently uh, the market works. So it affects the efficiency of a chosen mechanism. So one might wonder why do we not see markets with decentralized pricing where we would let participants choose the prices? The benefits of that approach are clear kind of, uh, the, that would allow for private information revelation, but at the same time, there are some costs associated with doing that and the costs are coming from the strategic behavior that such decentralization would enable. In this paper, I study how does decentralize, is decentralization and pricing affect the welfare of market participants on the right hailing platform. And so without further ado, let me introduce the platform I'm going to be using the data from. Uh, the platform is uh, from Russia. It's called InDriver. They originated in 2013. The company grew quite a bit. They are a very global company right now. They are present in 38 countries. Um, however, so they are essentially trying to do the same task as Uber or Lyft. But there is, main, there is one main difference uh, that distinguishes that platform. It is the writer who offers the price on the platform. And then the drivers can decide whether to agree to the offer price, make a counter offer, or ignore the request. So essentially, it's a decentralized uh, right hailing platform. Uh, I'm going to start with an overview of the paper. Uh, in the paper, I build an equilibrium model of a decentralized decided platform in which writers are making their own decisions which prices to offer. Then the drivers decide how to respond to that offer. And then the interaction between these two decisions defines equilibrium matching rates. I estimate the model primitives and demand and supply models are estimated separately. Both are estimated in two steps. Um, on the first step, I estimate players' beliefs about the matching rates directly of the data. And then on the second step, I use players' observed choices to back out the primitives. And then uh, it all boils down to the counterfactual in which I uh, compare the efficiency to a scenario in which the platform chooses the prices, but without private information of the participants. However, I still allow the platform to observe the information that is not private uh, and that uh, the participants have at the time of their decision making. Here are some findings. I actually find that both sides can benefit from decentralized pricing. Uh, we can, among all of the centralized pricing regimes, uh, I can find the one that would be preferred by the drivers and that's what I mean by on, an optimal centralized regime. And uh, when I compare that uh, optimal centralized regime to decentralized setting, I find that drivers still lose around 10% of their welfare. Likewise, I can find what is the regime that would be preferred by the writers and compared to decentralized setting, writers still lose around 4% of their welfare. So there are a few contributions that this paper makes. First of all, I consider a unique mechanism um, in which writers and drivers are making their own decisions. And I also build uh, a novel equilibrium model of a decentralized right yelling market. Uh, I quantify the importance of private information on the society of matching markets. Most papers have been theoretical so far, in addition, uh, this paper provides a unique empirical framework to study signaling effect. Uh, so the outline for today for me is to go through the data mechanism. I'm gonna show you uh, how, the, how the driver works, uh, what is the sample that I use, and briefly mention a few stylized facts that motivate some of my modeling decisions. I will then introduce the model and briefly go through the estimation and the results and um, go through the welfare analysis and show you what happens if the platform would be choosing up prices instead. So let me start with the data and mechanism. I have an access to company's internal data set that covers the universe of transactions from a single city. The unique feature of that data set that it contains information about unmatched requests. So I don't, I, I see not only the transactions that actually has taken place, but the ones where the writers were trying to get matched and the drivers were interested in placing the bid. Uh, the current sample runs from November 1st, 2018 to November 3rd, uh, 2019. And during that time, I see more than 64,000 unique passengers, more than 3,000 unique drivers, and more than 1.7 million requests. Now, that being said, the company wants to keep the city's identity private, so I'm not supposed to disclose much about the city. Uh, what I want to tell you is that the population of the city is below 200,000 people. So with that population, you can see that the platform is very active. 
Um, to the best of my knowledge, there are no uh, digital competitors in the, in the city during the time of the study. However, there are some traditional competitors such as taxi cabs or buses. Um, the city is relatively compact, has clearly defined boundaries, which uh, allows me to abstract from some spatial considerations in, in my paper. So I do not model the differences between different areas of the city. Um, here's the writer screen. So imagine that you're a writer. And in this case, uh, the screen is in English because the platform was operating in New York for a while. So uh, imagine that you are, um, that you have arrived to JFK uh, and you open an app. What are you going to see? You are going to see the idle drivers nearby. So these green small icons represent the idle drivers. Um, and you also see how many are there and how far are they. In addition, the platform will identify where you are. So in this case, it knows that you're at the airport and then you have to specify where you're going. So, so far it's had been, it has been very similar to Uber or Lyft. The main difference is that instead of uh, just accepting the price that the platform would show you after you specify the destination, you have to offer your own fare. And here's the field that says offer your fare. And then there is an additional field in case if you need, if you have some special request, maybe you need a child seat or something like that, you can just specify it in the comments in the wishes field. Once you press the button offer a fare, the request will go to all idle drivers. Um, now, this is the general screen and there are some specifics uh, that I see in the data uh, from the city that I study. First is that I see three discrete prices offered by the, by the riders. These three prices cover more than 95% of the requests. Discreteness comes from the fact that transactions are cash-based and it's just much easier to transact with certain bills. Um, however, conditional on the fact that I see three prices, I still see significant residual price variation once I control for many observables. So uh, since I have very detailed data set, I know where the trip has originated, I know the trip of the distance, I know uh, the, the time when it happened. So controlling for all of these observable factors, I still see that riders are offering different prices for similar trips. Uh, then uh, it should mean that there's something unobservable that drives riders' decisions and in the model that will be coming from the differences in their valuations. However, for the riders to display, um, to, to choose different prices, they, have, they need to have some incentives. There has to be a trade-off associated with offering different price. And indeed, there is a trade-off. The riders who are offering higher prices have higher chances of being matched, all other things equal. Another thing that I notice, and it's more specific to the model, in the model, I have uh, an assumption that the rider will try to make uh, only one attempt on the platform. So they will try to get matched only once, and if they're unlucky, they will just disappear for forever, which is roughly consistent with what I see in the data for the non-rush hours. And these are the hours that I'm gonna use in the estimation. Um, so here is the rider screen. Let me then move to the driver screen. Once the rider has press, uh, pressed offer a fare, the request has gone to all idle drivers. And this is what the idle driver is gonna see. First of all, he will learn the details of the request. He will learn where the rider is. He will learn where the rider is heading to. He will also learn what is the price that has been offered for the trip. In addition, he will also learn how far is he relative to this rider. So this blue um, blue segment here on the picture shows the, the driver that he is 0 0.4 kilometers away. With that information, then the driver can decide what to do with that request. And there are several options to choose from. First of all, he can decide to accept the request and here's the button accept. There are three options for counter offering. Um, in this case, the, there are uh, 42, 46, 49. They are pre-calculated by the platform based on the initial price that has been offered by the writer. There is a schedule for each given price that the writer can choose. And then there is another option which says skip. And that means that the writer can just, the driver can just ignore the request if he doesn't like this request and doesn't want to participate in it. So a few things that I document um, in, the, in the data. First of all, I see that the drivers prefer shorter trips with higher prices and lower distances. This fact perhaps is not that surprising. It just uh, shows me that they are profit maximizing on the platform. Another thing that I document is that the drivers are strategic. So if I look at the drivers who are participating in the uh, morning rush hours and compare them with their fellows who are participating later in the morning, what I see is that the drivers who participate in the rush hours tend to reject the requests at lower prices, much more often so compared to their uh, fellow drivers who are participating later. That again is probably not that surprising because it means that there are more requests in the morning, uh, they can be more pickier and uh, the prices are usually higher in the morning. So they, it doesn't make much sense for them to, to get matched with someone at the lower price. Um, 
And then uh, with all of these buttons that you have seen on the previous slide, you can imagine that there is some discreteness and sometimes the platform needs to break the ties. So what the platform is gonna be doing, it's gonna collect the responses and break the ties. It's gonna prioritize the drivers that have agreed to the offer price. And then among them, it's gonna break the ties based on the driver's distances and rankings. Uh, in what follows, I will actually focus on the distance and assume that this is the only variable that matters in, in the model, it will be that, but in reality, both of these things matter. Um, let me then go to the model. Uh, all of the observable characteristics uh, that are uh, available to all market participants will define the environment. So such as uh, the, the examples would be uh, time, of the, time of the day, uh, whether the day is working or weekend, uh, weather conditions, so everything that is can be easily observed on this market. Uh, time will be discrete and we'll have infinite horizon. Um, the, the, one, the period will be one second. Uh, riders are, will be short-lived and they will try to get matched only once. The drivers will, however, behave dynamically and have a discount factor beta. But of course, this is not an infant horizon game and drivers are not present there forever. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna introduce an exogenous probability that the game will be stopped. So the, for the driver, it will, might be the last period on the platform. So I'm gonna rescale this discount factor and call a driver's measure of impatience, of impatience and I'm gonna, use it, I'm gonna use delta in the notation. So there are three pieces of the model that they have, the demand side model, the supply side model, and the equilibrium. Let me go through all of them. Uh, so here's the demand model. Uh, the riders will arrive to the platform with a known probability at the beginning of each period. So the probability is lambda. And prior to the arrival, the, the rider takes a draw V, which is his valuation to be matched uh, instantaneously from a distribution with a known density. Uh, once, once he opens an app, once he has arrived to the market, he will observe the market state S. S here is the collection of the number of drivers and their distances. And using that information, he will form the beliefs atom. On the next slide, I'm gonna show you the components of that factor atom. The writer will be choosing between two prices, uh, the low or a high price. I have previously mentioned that there are three prices that are frequently chosen, but the highest price, 400, is rarely chosen outside of the rush hours. And I'm not gonna be estimating the model for the rush hours because interaction is slightly different for the rush hours. So instead, I'm gonna be focusing on two prices. The low price here is gonna be 300. The high price here is gonna be 350. And then once the request has been placed, there are three options, there are three outcomes that can happen to the writer. First of all, his request can be accepted. Uh, and in that case, he will be matched at the requested price. His request can be counter offered. Um, or, uh, and, and then the, uh, I have shown you that there are three options for the counter offering, but uh, in, the, in the model, I actually collapse them to one. The, the reason for that is that I rarely see two highest options chosen outside of the brush hours. So I'm, I'm focusing only on the lowest one. Uh, and that lowest one is going to be 50 and corresponds to the difference between the highest price and the lowest price. And then uh, the last outcome that can happen uh, is that the writer might remain unmatched. Um, so his request will be ignored. Let me uh, walk you through the writer's choice problem. So imagine that you're a writer and your valuation is V and you're trying to choose between a low and a high price. Um, with some probability, and that probability is new, which is highlighted on the screen right now, um, your request will be accepted. In this case, you will just decide, to, you will have your V, um, you will have your valuation, but you have to pay the price that you have offered. Or you can just take an outside option, which is normalized to zero. Uh, there is another option that might happen is that the request will be counter offered. Um, that probability is known to you as the writer. And then you will have to pay a higher price. Um, so in case if you have offered B and you, you face a counter offer, the price will be B plus Delta. Or you can take an outside option, which is again, normalized to zero. That problem has a relatively easy solution. The solution is the following. Uh, there is a threshold such that if the writer's valuation exceeds that threshold, he would go with a high price. If his valuation is within the range between the lower price that has been, offered, has been offered on the platform and this threshold, he will go with the low price. And of course, if his valuation is below the lowest price that he can get on the platform, he'll just decide not to participate, etc. Um, one thing to notice is that this threshold depends on S. S is the state of the market. So this is what has been seen by the writer on the screen. So imagine that if you open an app and you see a lot of cars, you should be fairly optimistic 
In that case, the threshold would be high for you. So it's very unlikely that you will actually go with a high price or you open an app and you don't see that many cars or they're really far. In this case, the threshold will be lower and you're more, you're more likely to offer a higher price. And so here is the probability we can compute uh, the probability of someone offering a high price when he or she is in the, in the state S. Um, and the main takeaway from the demand model is that the price uh, can signal two things. Uh, it can signal the writer's valuation and it can also signal writer's bad state. Um, so if we see two writers who are, they are in the same state. So they face the same screen. They see the same distribution of cars nearby. One has been offering a high price. Another one is offering a low price. We can immediately deduct that the one that has offered a high price values this trip more. So this is the signaling. Uh, likewise, what we can also say is that imagine that we know writers' valuations uh, and we, we don't know the states that they're facing. One has been offering high price, not one has been offering low price. We can immediately say that the one that has offered a high price faces much tougher state than the, the one that who uh, has offered a low price. Uh, keep this in mind because that is going to be an important piece once I go to the counterfactual. Let me then uh, go to the supply model. Uh, once this request has been placed, uh, all idle drivers will observe the offer price B. Each driver will also observe his own pickup distance, so this is DI, and a random shock associated with the request. So this is going to be a private information that the driver knows uh, about the request, but is not, it is not known uh, to, the, to other drivers, and it's not going to be known to, uh, to the platform either in the counterfactual scenario. Um, all drivers also don't observe their competitors, so they learn only their own distances. Each driver will choose whether to accept a request, make a counteroffer, or ignore the request using this information. Then the platform will collect the responses within 20 seconds and allocate the request based on the distance to a writer. So the closest one will get a right. The writer faces a match. If, if he accepts it, the match is formed. Um, and if he, the writer decides uh, to, um, to, to just reject the, the, the proposal, then the, the driver remains idle and the writer will leave the platform. As you can imagine, there are all kinds of different requests that the, writer, that the drivers will be seeing. Uh, first of all, the requests differ by prices. So some of the requests will be coming to the platform and they will be uh, having low price. Some of them will be having high prices. They will also differ by the distance to a rider. So there are going to be uh, some requests that are, will be very close to the, to the drivers and some will be very far away. Uh, I will assume that the private shocks are coming from a normal distribution, which is centered around zero, um, but there is a known variance. And so that the standard deviation is going to be sigma epsilon. Uh, and I assume that the, the shocks are IID. There's, uh, each driver will know how much time it will take him to complete a request of a certain type. And that time will depend on the distance. Of, so if I'm really far, I know that it's going to take me a while to actually go and pick up the rider. Um, in the estimation, I add another dimension, how requests are different, and um, that is going to be the trip distance. Uh, however, for the sake of um, keeping the formulas very short and concise, I actually took it out uh, from the presentation, but it is in the paper that's going to be in the estimation. So trips will also be different by the distances. So with the, then uh, what is the what is that the driver will be doing? He will be choosing between these three options, accept, counteroffer, or ignore. In, in case if he decides to accept uh, and he wins the request, he will receive a static utility U bar um, that is going to depend on the price. So the higher is the price, the higher is the utility and the distance, the pickup distance. So the further away the writer is, the lower is going to be my utility from being um, matched with this writer. And then uh, there is the shock that is going to be uh, it's going to be uh, received uh, by the driver only in the case when he's matched. He will learn about the shock. He will know the value, but um, he's not going to uh, receive it unless he's matched. Very similarly, in case if he decides to make a counteroffer, his utility is going to be uh, still U bar, but it's going to be a different payment, um, plus um, epsilon shock as well. So the shock here is not action specific, which is a standard thing, I think, of the discrete choice. Uh, instead, it's a request specific. And so there are going to be also known probabilities by the drivers um, to win the request. Um, they are going to depend on the type of the request that they see. So if I, if the, 
the drivers know that the platform prioritizes the drivers who have agreed. The, the drivers know that the, 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 they have higher chances of winning the request when they're closer. So uh, all of these things are going to be in their beliefs. And um, the, in the equilibrium, the probability that they will win the request, if conditional on them accepting, is going to be higher than uh, the probability that they will win if they, if they come from. Um, the driver will miss 20 seconds if he decides to take any action. So if he participates in any uh, form, he will he will spend 20 seconds trying to get matched. During that time, the platform will be collecting responses from other fellow drivers. And then if he decides to ignore, he will lose five seconds. Uh, he will still spend some time st studying the details of the request, but still uh, he will get back to the pool of vital drivers much faster by, skip by skipping the request. Uh, here's the driver's payoff. In, imagine that you're a driver and you see a request with a price B uh, with a distance DI uh, and you know your own shock. So uh, epsilon I is your shock. Uh, what are what what are you going to get if you decide to accept uh, that request? With some probability, you will get you will win that request. Um, that probability is highlighted on the screen, and then. Um, in case if you win, you get a static utility from uh, from that match, and then you get the epsilon shock, and then you get the continuation value after you complete the request and become an, an idle driver again. So here V is the value of being idle, which is an endogenous object. And I'm going to go through uh, through that in steps how to calculate that endogenous object. With some probability, you will lose that request, and that probability is going to be one minus mu. And in that case, you will come back to the pool of idle drivers much faster. So the continuation value in that case is different. Very similarly, uh, we, um, we can imagine how the payoff for the counter offering is going to look like. There's a probability that he will win the request, but the static utility is going to be different because the, the payment will be different. He asked for a higher payment and he won, so the writer has accepted that. Um, and there is a probability that he's going to lose that request. That probability is different, but the continuation value is going to be the same in, in case if he loses uh, relative to the case when he agrees. Uh, however, for the case when he decides to ignore the request, the continuation value will be different because he will become idle much faster than in, in the cases above. And so the driver's problem essentially then boils down to choosing among these three options, among these uh, three buttons. And the solution to that is relatively simple. There are cutoffs for the epsilon shock such that if the driver sees a very good shock, he will just decide to accept that request and not talk, and take his chances of counter-offering it. In case if he sees a really bad shock, he will just decide to ignore the request altogether. And if he's seeing something in between, he will think, well, you know, I, I might not be willing to drive this rider if, if I just accept, but if he pays me more, I, I might be willing to do so. And so in this case, he will decide to counter-offer. And we can compute what is the, gonna be the probability that the driver who's seeing a request uh, with the type B and DI will be accepting or making a counter-offer. However, the, the drivers don't know in advance what, uh, what the, the full types of the shocks that they will observe. However, uh, they can compute the expected value because they, they know the distribution of the epsilon shocks and they know, uh, and they know that the prob prob appropriate probabilities of certain requests arrival into the platform. These are, this, the last one, the probabilities are endogenously um, defined. And so then with that information, each driver can compute what is gonna be the value function of being idle. So he, uh, there's a, imagine that there is this whole space of possible requests. There is a, a probability that that request will come into the platform. Then um, the driver will take an optimal decision uh, and, and, and optimal decision. But there's another thing that can happen. Um, the, there's a chance that nothing will come to the platform. And in this case, the driver will just transition into the next period idle. So this is what this equation uh, below here stands for. Essentially, it summarizes all that. And then there's the last part of the model, which is an equilibrium. Um, there are beliefs. Um, I don't wanna overload you with formulas. They are in the paper. However, what is important to keep in mind is that there are beliefs of the writers. These are ADAs, the probability is that the request will be matched at different prices. And they, these beliefs depend on driver's actions. Likewise, the drivers have beliefs. Their beliefs are uh, summarized in the probabilities of request arrival, so this alphas, and the probabilities to win. And they also depend on the writer's decisions. So uh, this is a two-sided platform in which each side affects the other side. And all of these beliefs can be computed. 
And so here's the notion the, of the equilibrium. It's a rational expectations equilibrium that consists of the writers and drivers' beliefs, such that the writers are maximizing their expected utilities given their beliefs, and the state that they face. Uh, writers' actions affect their rival rates. Idle drivers maximize expected utilities. V has to be a fixed point of this equation that we have gone through. And then market participants need to have rational expectations um, so that the beliefs will be self-fulfilling given this optimizing behavior. So um, I, I will briefly go through the estimation and the results because that's uh, not the most interesting part for today's talk, I guess. Um, what I'm gonna do, uh, what I do in the estimation, I define the market and I, for now, I've estimated the model for even hours of working days. Uh, I estimated demand and supply model separately. So I use various techniques to extract the beliefs from the data. So the, I have eta for the writers, mu and alpha for the drivers. And then uh, on the second step, I use uh, maximum likelihood estimation to, uh, to obtain the model primitives. Uh, and the, the data is so rich that I can actually estimate some of them directly uh, of the data. Let me go through the primitives. Uh, for the estimation, I add another dimension to the request type. So there, there are short and long trips. On the demand side primitives, what I'm trying to uncover using the model is the density of writers' valuations. And what I see directly of the data is exogenous rates of arrival. So these lambdas are directly seen observed in the data. There are a few primitives on the supply side that I'm also trying to uncover using the model. The, these are the static utilities, measure of impatience, and variance of absolute shocks. And there are some other uh, primitives that I'm estimating using um, the data. And that is going to be the number of vital drivers and distribution of distances to the riders. Um, I parameterize a few things. So first of all, I parameterize the distribution of the valuations. Uh, it's going to be a gamma distribution truncated from below that is going to have two parameters, shape and scale. Um, and on the supply side, I parameterize the utility so that the static utility is equal to the price minus the per mile costs associated with picking up a, tri uh, a, a trip at the distance D minus fixed costs associated with picking up any, any trip uh, in the market M. And then there are additional costs associated with picking up the requests that have um, lo longer distances. And so here are the estimates. I just want to briefly go through them. Um, as you can see, there's some variation across markets. Uh, instead of showing you all of the shape and scale parameters, uh, which is probably not that much interesting, uh, I'm going to show you the median valuations and probability that the writer would have uh, reject, uh, rejected uh, the trip if the platform was mandating a higher price. So this is a measure of price sensitivity of the writers. And as you can see, uh, for instance, 10 a.m. market is very different from the rest of them. And I attribute that to the changes in the composition of travelers. There are more business associated traveling happen around, happening around 10 a.m. And so um, the, the usually the, these trips are paid by the companies. So it naturally makes the consumers less price sensitive. But um, still, there is some variation across markets. On the supply side, there are also some parameters. I, I don't want to go through all of them. A few things that I would like to mention is that, that the variance of epsilon shock is actually large. So you should look at the last column, which is the transformed. It's in money terms. So the lower price that has been offered on the platform is 300. And so the, the variance of the epsilon shock is uh, more than one third of that lowest price, which means that private information plays a significant role. Um, in this platform. The, the driver's decisions uh, sometimes are affected by some factors that cannot be observed by the platform. Um, so with that being said, let me then, um, I would be happy to talk more about the details of the estimation and the parameters, maybe once we get to the Q&A session, but let me go to the welfare analysis because I feel like I'm slightly running out of time. So, so far you have seen uh, a case in which uh, the Pricing uh, was done in a decentralized manner. So the rider was choosing between the low price and the high price. And then the drivers were accepting counter offering or ignoring. And then the platform was proposing a match. Uh, one reminder that the price that was chosen by the writer was reflecting two things. First of all, it was showing the writer's valuation, was signaling the writer's valuation. And also it was uh, signaling the market conditions in which he, he was at. So the screen that he saw, uh, how many cars were there. Uh, what I wanted to do with the centralized pricing, I wanted uh, to force the platform to choose the price. So the platform will be the one who's going to be choosing between the same options. It's either low or high. And then the writer will decide whether to accept that price. So it's, it's a very similar uh, setting to uh, centralized mechanisms in which you're just shown the price and then you decide what to do with that. 
However, I will still allow the drivers uh, to reject the request if they don't like it. So, but I take away their option to make a counter offer. That way the platform fully controls the price that is gonna be chosen for a trip. And then uh, the platform will still break the ties in the same manner as it does right now. But uh, I needed to find a way to inform a platform about the market conditions, otherwise it wouldn't be a fair comparison. And uh, I needed to take this uh, S, which was a vector, which is a multi-dimensional vector, was containing the number of idle drivers and their sorted distances. Um, and I needed to compress it into some sort of an index so that it would be easier for the platform to choose the price. And hopefully, uh, well, thankfully, my, my demand model is actually allowing me to do that. Uh, I'm going to use this threshold um, that um, was computed by the writer before um, and that depend uh, on the state. And just a reminder, from the writer's point of view, when the writer was facing a very high threshold, that was considered as the good market. And in this market, the writer was very unlikely to choose a high price. He would probably go with a low price. And uh, when the threshold was very low, that meant that the market was bad, and then the writer would have chosen a high price. So let me then tell you about the following case. Imagine that we have the platform uh, that can compute this threshold. So it knows what the writer would have been doing if he, if he was on his own. So we have these two panels. Uh, on the upper parts of the panels, we essentially have the same picture except for the price that has been chosen by the platform. That is the, dead, uh, uh, the red dotted line. Uh, but let, let forget about that for a second, and let me actually focus on this part first. So imagine that the platform knows the threshold, so it knows this V hat, and it knows that if the writer was choosing on his own, if his valuation was below that threshold, he would choose a low price. In case if uh, his valuation was higher than that uh, threshold, he would go with a high price. So that is essentially that part of the graph, and it's the same between right and left. But the difference between right and left is what happens if the platform tries to set up our prices. And on the left part, we have when the, the case when the platform is choosing a low price. On the right part, we have the case when the platform is choosing a high price. Let, uh, let me talk about, let, let me walk you through the effects that will happen with that. So imagine that the platform is choosing a low price. In this case, it mandates all of the writers, uh, regardless of their type, to actually pay low price. It's going to allow everyone who is interested to participate in the market because their valuations will still be uh, above that low, lower price that has been offered. However, it's going to shut down the signaling. So the writers who would have chosen a high prices for themselves are no longer allowed to do so. On the right, in the right panel, so here, the platform mandates a high price. And what happens with that? Well, there are going to be some writers who won't feel an immediate effect. They would have been offering high prices to begin with. So here are they. However, there are two other types of writers who will be affected. First of all, some of the writers will find the price higher um, than their valuations, and they will decide not to participate. So in this lower panel, we can compute what is going to be the share of such writers. In addition, there is a second type. Um, that type was shading. So they were offering something that they couldn't afford to pay a higher price, but they decided not to. Uh, they find profit maximizing for them or utility maximizing uh, for them to just shade their valuation and go with a low price instead. When the platform mandates a higher price, it essentially forces them to pay a high price. So with these two graphs, we, we can see a very well-known trade-off in the economics between the quantity versus prices. When the centralized platform tries to mandate the, uh, the higher prices, what happens is going to lose some of the writers. However, when it wants to keep the writers on the platform, it's going to be losing in, uh, in pricing, right? So it's going to be uh, closing the, sh uh, the signaling. And so the writers who would have wanted to signal won't be allowed to do so. Um, this trade-off is less present under the decentralized machine. Um, so what I do in this counterfactuals and then what I'm going to show you, I'm basically deciding how often the, the platform will mandate a higher price on the platform based on the market conditions. So I'm going to be using a cutoff rule uh, for some markets or so for some S when this cutoff is going to be, uh, when this threshold will be lower than a certain number, which is going to be a V cutoff, that platform, uh, that, that situation will be considered as the bad market for the platform uh, or from the bad market from the writer's point of view. And in this case, the platform will mandate a higher price. If that threshold was exceeding that cutoff, the platform will be uh, considering that market as good and would be choosing a lower price. So essentially, the platform is trying to mimic what the writer would be doing uh, and trying to be smart. It's an example of a search pricing. 
Um, but I, I could have computed uh, equilibrium for all various cutoffs. And that's what I actually did. But presenting cutoffs is kind of confusing. So the cutoffs can actually be mapped in the percentage of trips that are priced high on the platform. And I think that is slightly easier to understand. Let me start with a relatively simple graph. Uh, imagine that we have two types of trips. We have short and, uh, and long trips, right? Uh, on the axis, axis we, I'm going to have short trips. On the uh, y-axis, I'm going to have long trips. And what uh, the axis show, are showing me, what is the percentage among all of the trips that are short or long? What is the percentage will be priced high? So we have them two extreme cases, the left lower corner and the upper right corner. In the left lower corner, we have all of the trips on the platform to be priced low. The, it is a uniform pricing and the price is low. When we are moving away from the left lower corner into the upper right corner, what we're doing, we're, uh, we're pricing more and more trips on the platform with the higher price. And so uh, somewhere here, we would have uh, a case, again, with the uniform pricing, but when all of the prices on the platform are high. And so essentially here, then we have everything in the middle, all of these possible pricing regimes. And uh, this is a very simple graph to understand because of course, if you are pricing uh, more and more trips higher, you're gonna lose more and more riders. And that's what essentially this graph is showing us. Um, here is the, the another graph, very similar in structure, but what it shows us is the matching rates. So of course, when we are gonna be kicking out some consumers, we're gonna be improving the conditions for the ones that are staying. So the current matching rates in the decentralized setting are around 72%. In case if the platform decides to make all of the prices low and uniformly low, we would be in this left lower corner. And in this case, the matching rates will be around 65%. When we are moving away from that and moving into the more um, centralized, uh, uniform, high pricing regime, we're going to be improving the match for the for the riders that remain, and their matching rates will be around seventy five percent. Then we can look at the drivers' welfare. Uh, I what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you the percentage change in the drivers' value function of being idle uh, across all of the centralized pricing regime and compare it to the decentralized one. Um, and here's the result. Um, first of all, one of, one of the things to notice is that the drivers don't like uh, cases, when, extreme cases. They don't like the case when all of the prices are uniformly low because they're losing in earnings. They, don't, they also don't like the case when all of the prices are uniformly high. So when we're in the right upper corner, because in this case, they will be uh, losing one quantities. So they prefer to have some sort of, some, some level of price uh, discrimination. The, the optimal one is circled here. And, and but even under this optimal one, which means it's they have highest uh, welfare among all the centralized pricing regimes that I consider, they still lose around 10% of their welfare relative to decentralized platform. Likewise, we can compute the measure of the consumer welfare. And in this case, we will also find that riders don't seem to be liking the extreme cases. However, their preferred regime is different by, from the preferred regime uh, of the drivers, but under that preferred regime, they still lose around 4% of their welfare. So with that, um, let me actually conclude. Um, I have presented an equilibrium model of decentralized to the platform today. Uh, the results that I have shown you suggest that private information plays an important role for two-sided market's efficiency. Cent centralized platform that tries to set up the prices faces a trade-off between quantity and prices that trade-off is not present in decentralized setting. Um, and in this case, what I find is that the signaling and quantity effect dominate the shading effect um, present on the platform. However, I, I want to warn you uh, that the results might vary with the market density. Uh, today's talk is very short, so I, I, I don't have much time to actually go through that, but I would be happy to talk more about it. And um, thank you for coming. Here's my email in case if you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renata, and uh, thanks for like uh, keeping us uh, on time. Yeah. So uh, now let's uh, uh, have uh, Alex, uh, who is our discussant. Yeah, uh, and Alex will help us bring our understanding to the next level, I believe. Right. So Alex, go ahead. Let's hope. Uh, thank you, Renata. Um, I will not 
repeat the model. I think Renato made an excellent uh, job of presenting the paper. Um, I will just uh, note that I think it's a beautiful paper. There is a novel data set, which is large and detailed, and there is very comprehensive uh, structural analysis with a big uh, intelligent model uh, and uh, actually very impressive. Um, and it works on important application of online platform. I think uh, as, as time goes on, in fact, it becomes even more and more important because there are more and more platforms uh, in all different applications that, that uh, start operating and it's important to understand them, but also uh, not only looking at the important application, but also delivering very important message that we uh, actually uh, need to treat um, private information and strategic behavior on these platforms uh, very seriously and certainly more seriously than I think uh, usually is treated. And I think uh, we should have uh, more and more papers uh, like that, uh, very nice. Uh, Job. And, and I will uh, give uh, three uh, more specific comments. I mean, I'm a theorist, so they will be more theoretical in general. Um, but the first comment will be a little bit uh, more, more applied, I guess. Um, uh, it will be very specific be, uh, regarding one estimate uh, that um, there is an estimate of a discount factor 0. 0.97 per second. That means that. Uh, in general, there is 3% value lost every second, and this seems to be a, a little bit too high. I understand that it compounds also probability of quitting, but I still had a feeling that, that it, 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 it is a bit too high of a discount. And because, uh, for example, it also indicates that in this 20 seconds that the platform actually collects the request, uh, two thirds of the value is gone. Um, so, and I was wondering, um, what can drive it in the current model? Maybe there is something which is driving it. And maybe one thing that could, could happen that maybe there are some part of drivers who just always accept all requests. I wonder whether this can happen and, and, and maybe uh, more generally, whether you can observe in your data heterogeneity uh, across drivers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but also heterogeneity across um, uh, riders actually. That is whether you, your data, I was, it was not clear from reading the paper whether your data allows to track in time the same driver or the same rider, mm -hmm. because if so, maybe it would allow to make even, even more uh, precise estimation um, of the model, uh, because you can imagine that, yeah, some riders can always accept all requests, but also some, some drivers, sorry, and some riders, riders can be possibly just richer, uh, and, and that could uh, consistently will be uh, charging higher prices. Mm -hmm. And I think that that could possibly um, would be interesting to address um, and what to hear what you think about it. Um, but maybe then I first complete with two other comments I have. Um, and two other comments. The second one is um, uh, relates to this main message of private information and its importance, which I think is very nice. And I think it is indeed uh, highlights that the current platforms need to um, think a little bit more in their about their design, like think about Uber and Lyft. At the same time, I was not sure whether contrasting decentralized and centralized market is the right um, language, um, because uh, in some sense, um, like from a theory perspective, centralized planet can actually replicate pretty much everything that can be done in decentralized. Uh, that is maybe uh, bargaining versus posted prices would be a bit more precise uh, language. Um, and just to just to reiterate um, on that. Um, as you highlight, indeed, private information may be very important, heterogeneity. And if you are a platform who, are, who is designed some centralized mechanism, you might actually indeed want to screen this. But it may be done not necessarily through bargaining, uh, but it could be done, for example, by allowing the riders indicate that the trip is urgent. And it can be easily done in centralized manner in some mm -hmm. sense. So then you uh, you give an option to make a flood, this, I don't know, small fire uh, that, that you, you're willing as a rider to pay more, but to get the request. And, and I think um, um, that can be implemented in a centralized way, and probably it will be a more clever design than currently what Uber has and, and Lyft has indeed. Um, and the third uh, comment is kind of follow up on the second one, that it actually raises, I think, an interesting theoretical question. Uh, your analysis how to optimally design this system uh, that is actually so if you if you can actually you know uh, allow to buyers um, 
buyers and sellers uh, uh, to somehow uh, provide this private information? How should you aggregate? And it, it's it, in some sense, it's it's a classical question in marketing design literature. But there is also there's additional twist of these intertemporal incentives that are inherent to these markets because the environment is dynamic because you can you can uh, wait and uh, for another buyer and there's also the intertemporal competition across uh, drivers which I think adds interesting uh, dimension to this even ther purely theoretical problem and I think if there are some aspiring uh, theorists in the in the audience that could be something uh, to think about and I think this uh, application motivates very well why why it is important to think about it and that you can get a, a lot of gains in efficiency uh, and then it would be also interesting maybe to compare to this uh, benchmark uh, that you provided kind of posted prices one benchmark this bargaining procedure is another benchmark but another benchmark would be some sort of optimal information aggregation um, but this is certainly it is a complicated uh, theoretical question yes and this is my comments. <laughs>